As you may or may not know, I'm a Londoner, more to the point a South Londoner. And as a young plainly, I always wondered why people would call this plot of empty land Croydon Airport, even though there was and still is a lack of planes. Well, this is partly due to today's subject, the tragic 1924 de Havilland air crash. And this event would not only influence the direction of London's air transport, but also be an important milestone in the history of investigations into commercial air disasters. In the early 1920s, Croydon Airport, just on the southern outskirts of Greater London, was the de facto main airport for the UK's capital. Originally constructed as two separate airports, the Bennington Aerodrome and the Wadden Aerodrome during the First World War. Many of these small airstrips popped up to defend against the threat of Zeppelin attacks on the capital. In 1920, the two runways were merged to form the Croydon Aerodrome and was tasked with handling all international flights to and from London. During this time, Plough Lane, a main road that divided the airport, remained open to traffic and would be intermittently closed for arriving and departing flights. I should probably say that, even though this was London's international airport, only a few scheduled flights would take place each day, nowhere near the scale of Gatwick or London Heathrow today. Early destinations were Rotterdam, Paris, and Amsterdam. However, Berlin Tempelhof was added in 1923 for the Paris Peace Talk. Come 1924, and the Croydon Aerodrome was the first airport in the world to have a new safety feature, an air traffic control tower. The growth of the burgeoning new airport created the UK's first national airline called Imperial Airways, founded in March 1924 with a fleet of around 22 aircraft. The backbone of the Imperial Airways fleet was the de Havilland DH-34, a single engine biplane capable of carrying 10 passengers and two crew, consisting of a plywood fuselage, wooden wings and a 12 cylinder engine outputting 450 horsepower. Needless to say, such an aircraft would not be considered as safe by today's standards. On the 24th of December 1924, the Noon Express de Havilland DH-34 GEBBX was getting ready for a scheduled flight between Croydon and France, with eight souls on board. The two-year-old airplane had been in service with another operator since March 1922, and in April 1924, the aircraft had received a new non-standard set of wings. After a collision in May of the same year, the plane received another new set of wings, albeit this time of standard configuration, receiving a new certificate of airworthiness on the 24th of November, just one month before its ill-fated last flight. Moments after takeoff, the aircraft was seen flying low over the town of Purley, circling and zigzagging before entering a nosedive and crashing into the ground with a large explosion. Within 10 minutes, according to the Yorkshire Evening Post, leaving nothing but distorted metal parts of the aircraft. Hardly surprising, due to the flammable material of the aircraft's wings and fuselage. No one survived the crash with one eyewitness to the wreckage site saying, I ran to the spot, but by the time I got there, the whole machine was burnt away. I could see in the wreckage, charred remains of bodies. All of the passengers must have died instantaneously. Their clothes were gone and their bodies were black. None of the bodies could be recovered from the wreckage until the fire brigade managed to get the inferno under control. All passengers and crew were lost in the crash. The accident was Imperial Airways' first fatal accident, not a good start for the newly formed company. An insurance claim was approved for the loss of the aircraft from the British Aviation Insurance Group. Now, aviation of this period was hardly the safest endeavour, and a fatal crash, albeit tragic, wasn't the first accident linked to Croydon or even linked to this particular type of aircraft. With no immediate obvious cause for the crash, an inquiry was launched on the 29th of December in Croydon Town. The initial parts of the investigation heard the basic facts, for example the pathologist reports, evidence of identification and witness reports. The inquest was adjourned until the 9th of January 1925. Upon returning, the investigation heard evidence that the plane had, in the days leading up to the accident, suffered with engine troubles due to low oil pressure engine issues would be backed up by witness reports of the aeroplane's long and slow takeoff from the airstrip, taking 700 yards to finally get off the ground, and even then slowly increasing altitude before eventually crashing. Witnesses near the crash site in Purley, one and a half miles away from Croydon, stated that the aircraft's engine was making a rattling noise. However, both these reports were contradicted by Imperial Airways' own witnesses, who claimed engine noise was normal and every departure of the day took off long and slow due to the rain-soaked grass runway. The plane had been running uphill as well, which would have also slowed down the gain in altitude. 
The inquest was adjourned again to be reopened on the 14th of January. At the reopening of the inquest, a public inquiry was announced. It would be the first of such an inquiry for an air crash in British history. In lead up to the public inquiry, the inquest in Croydon heard more evidence of the loading weight of the plane and the condition of the runway. During this time, an accusation was thrown at Imperial Airways regarding interference with a witness. However, this was quickly shot down by the coroner. Interestingly, the plane was near full capacity at 710 kilograms of an allowed 713. The inquiry was adjourned again until the 21st of January, only to be adjourned again in light of new evidence and Imperial Airways General Manager Major Wood Humphreys being taken ill. This would hold up the inquiry until February the 12th. In the meantime, a public inquiry at the Strand's Royal Courts of Justice in London had started its hearing on the 23rd of January. Headed by Sir Arthur Colfax and with Professor B.M. Jones and James Swinburne assessing. Originally I had written a detailed day-to-day -day rundown of the public inquest. However, it did make the video a bit long and boring and on many of the days the same points were brought up and argued. So I'll do a brief rundown of each day. The first day focused on evidence based around pilot David Stewart. His career started in 1917 during the First World War, earning in his military career the Military Cross, Distinguished Flying Cross and Air Force Cross. Unarguably, it would seem that the pilot in charge of the plane was very well experienced for any type of situation that would have come across him. It was also discovered that a petrol pipe in the wreckage had a limited flow of fuel. However, it was unknown whether the damage was pre or post crash. On the second day of the inquiry on the 25th of January, saw Major Cooper, who was in charge of investigating the crash for the investigation branch, gave evidence based on over 100 witness testimonies, seeming to suggest that the pilot had encountered engine troubles and was attempting to return to Croydon Airport. The plane had been away from Croydon for six days before the crash, and reports had been put in claiming that the engine had been running rough. Upon returning to Croydon, the engine oil was drained and refilled, and the engine was ran on the ground for 20 minutes. Cooper suggested that the engine should have been tested more rigorously, and he also condemned the fact that the fuel pipe used on the plane was not fit for military use. The inquiry was adjourned for a few more days, whilst charts of the aircraft's previous flights were analysed by experts. On the third day of the inquest, the analysed chart showed that the engine had no issues on the two flights leading up to the crash. However, on a previous flight to Amsterdam, a pilot did report that the engine had fluctuating oil levels. Nothing was done at the time of report due to the plane being due to return back to Croydon within an hour. Throughout the return flight, the oil pressure fluctuated and the plane was turned back to Amsterdam. However, this was due to poor weather conditions. Whilst at Amsterdam, a mechanic had a look at the plane. The mechanic was called to give evidence and stated that he replaced all 24 spark plugs and test ran the engine for half an hour. On the return journey back to Croydon, the engine oil held pressure, but still fluctuated. The Croydon-based mechanic also gave evidence similar to the Croydon inquiry that he had changed the oil and had ground tested the engine, yielding satisfactory results. The following day resumed the inquest and the inspector of engines at Imperial Airways stated that the engine was in a service ready condition. During the day, Imperial Airways maintenance schedule was brought into question by Mr. Bafus a representative for one of the crash victims. However, a representative from the company's insurance who had paid out on the claim for the plane crash said that they had no issues with the way that the plane was maintained. On the fifth day, the director of Imperial Airways, Frank Surley, gave evidence to the inquiry, claiming that any pilot working for the company could refuse to fly any aircraft if they felt it was unsafe. Furthermore, the day saw more evidence on the aircraft's fuel pipes and that armoured and unarmoured variants were in use and that both were approved by the Air Ministry. A representative of Dean Napier and Son, an engineering company, backed up the claim of Imperial Airways that their mechanical maintenance schedule was of the highest quality. For the sixth day, the representative of the crash victims brought into question again the maintenance schedule of the plane. Not only Imperial came under attack, but this time the airport itself was under scrutiny for suitability for use with airliners. The inquiry was adjourned until the 2nd of February. Once the inquiry resumed, Croydon Airport announced that the site would be extended 
and the road dividing the runway would be diverted to allow for extra space. The announcement included that an act of parliament would be drafted for financing and would be secured as it was thought that Croydon was the ideal place for a London airport. The inquiry was adjourned for one final time. On the final day, Mr Bafis's accusations were rejected and it was found that the Air Ministry had worked within its remit with Imperial Airways. Sir Arthur Colfax announced that he would visit with his assistants to Croydon Airport before the public report would be published. The 10th February saw the publishing of the report into the accident. It was found that the aircraft was airworthy and that conditions of the runway on the day were a contributory factor. Both the Air Ministry, Imperial Airways and pilot David Stewart were cleared of all blame. The cause of the accident was an unknown mechanical failure, leading to a stall on an attempted emergency landing. The damage to the petrol pipe that was under scrutiny was agreed to have been caused post-crash during the rescue efforts. The local inquest, which had been adjourned during the public inquiry, resumed on the 12th of February. The coroner found that the public inquiry had shown that no one was at fault, and a verdict of misadventure was agreed by the jury. Essentially, the result was a bit of an anti-climax as no one was to blame. However, the accident would set a precedent for in-depth investigations into further civilization accidents in the UK. Croydon Airport would continue to grow over the following decades, seeing use during the Second World War and some civil use post-war. The growth of the airport would be part of its undoing as it encroached on local housing, leaving little room for expansion for newer, larger aircraft of the post-war era. The airport in its career saw eight crashes, many of which were fatal. This coupled with the lack of space made other airstrips such as Heathrow a more commercially attractive option. The last plane to depart from Croydon took off in 1959, leaving a large undeveloped space behind. Today the airport is an industrial estate and some playing fields. However, one of the original buildings remain known as Airport House. The world's oldest control tower still remains at the site and many local roads are named after aviators and aircraft. Did you enjoy the video? I hope you did. If you did, leave a like. And if you'd like to see more videos on air crashes, let me know in the comments. If you like the channel and you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing for all the latest videos. If you fancy it, you can also support the channel financially through Patreon. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.